If y'all would, open in your Bible to 1 Kings chapter 12. 1 Kings chapter 12. and I encourage you to get one between the worship and Bible class. Uh, the notes that we have in the bulletin, Lynn Brantley, this is Mary Adams' son-in-law's father. Uh, he is now out of the hospital and they've moved him to a nursing home. So he is progressing, but we want to continue to remember uh, Lynn Brantley in our prayers. And then as we mentioned last week, Sandra Tankersley, they, they did the CAT scan and they have changed her chemotherapy and so we're praying that this chemo is going to work a little bit better but continue to remember Sandra Tankersley in your prayers and then uh, also uh, Kathy Garrett's grandson lost his father last week and they've asked for us to remember the Nelson family in our prayers and then there's a new address for Jerry Kidd in the bulletin is there anyone else that we need to mention yes ma'am Your niece, what was her name? Karen Swanner. Remember her and her family. Karen Swanner? And did you say it was her husband? And it's Swanner? Was it unexpected? Or? Well, he's been sick for Okay. So Karen Swanner's husband passed away. And they're members of the church up at the Grapevine Congregation. They've been asking, or they ask us to remember the Swanner family in our prayers. All right, anybody else? All right, if not, again, open in your Bible to 1 Kings chapter 12. We'll pick up where we were last week, but let's begin with a prayer this morning. Our God and Father in heaven, we come to you, Father, and we're so grateful for the recent rains that you blessed us with. And Father, we're grateful for the beautiful sunshine that we see this morning. And Father, we just stand in awe of your willingness to take care of us in so many different ways. And Father, we do have those of our number that are sick, and Father, we want to Thank you that Lynn Brantley is doing better, but we'd ask that you continue to be with him and his family. And Father, we pray that Sandra's new chemo is going to work and that, uh, Father, that she can uh, find some relief from this cancer. And Father, we're saddened that uh, Karen Swanner's husband passed away and Braden Nelson's father passed away. And Father, we know there are many that are suffering from the loss of loved ones, and Father, we just pray that you would watch over them. Father, we pray that you would reach down and comfort them as only you can. Father, we are thankful that uh, we have so many that are recovering, and we'd ask that you continue to be with them. And Father, we pray for those that are not able to be with us this morning, especially we want to remember our sister Ann Tee as she's in the nursing home and unable to to be with the saints, and Father, we know that she longs to be here, and we just pray that you will be with her and watch over her. And Father, there are others on our sick list, and, and you know their needs, and Father, we just pray that you'll watch over them. Father, we also <clears throat> want to thank you for being such a gracious God, and Father, as we look into the Old Testament and we see the children of Israel and, and so many of the things that they did that were contrary to your will. Father, we pray that we will learn from those lessons of history. <clears throat> Father, that we will not repeat the same mistakes that they've made. <clears throat> Father, we uh, know that in a reality that uh, as the children of Israel had these kings and Father, so many of them were wicked men, but Father, we know that in reality you were still their king even though they had rejected your authority. And Father, we pray that as your children today, that we won't look to men to be our leaders, that we will look to you as our king and Jesus as our 
Savior and King and Father, we just pray that uh, everything we do would bring honor and glory to His name. And Father, uh, we thank you for the great men of the Old Testament that, that stood strong, those men and women under the Old Testament that lived godly lives even in the midst of great darkness. And Father, we pray that we can have that same attitude in our lives. And Father, we offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So uh, as we're looking at 1 Kings chapter 12, we see that the kingdom of God is about to divide. And of course, when we look at this, we realize that this was the, <coughs> the Old Testament kingdom of God. And you remember that uh, when uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 8, when the children of Israel demanded that they wanted to have a king, and why did they want to have a king? Everybody else has got one. We want to be just like everybody else, and everybody else has a king, so we want to have a king. And you remember that God told them through Samuel that this king is going to tax you. He's going to take your children. He's going to make them work for him. You're going to pay uh, taxes, and they're, they're, it's, it's just not going to be a good situation in what they say. We want one anyway. We don't care what you say about it, and of course... Uh, in reality, when Samuel was upset about it, God said, listen, Samuel, they haven't rejected you. They rejected me. I'm their king, and they rejected me. And so there were three men that reigned in what we call the United Kingdom. Started out with King Saul. He reigned for 40 years, and as we pointed out in our study over his kingdom, he reigned illegitimately for about 38 years. Uh, he was king, and he had made the mistake of uh, not doing what God said in 1 Samuel chapter 15 when God said you go utterly destroy the Amalekites. And of course he brought back some, he brought back animals, he brought back the king of Agag, the king Agag. And, and of course God said at that point that I am rending the kingdom from you. It's not going to be yours anymore. We don't know the exact number of years that Saul had reigned when that happened. It, it seems like when you read the text, it's been about two years. And so he continues to reign illegitimately for 38 years. David should have been the king, but instead of allowing uh, David to be the king, Saul persecuted him and sought after him and tried to kill him. And ultimately, uh, David had opportunity to kill Saul, but he said, I'm not going to raise a hand against God's anointed, that God will take care of it when he's ready. And of course, after 40 years, Saul dies in battle. David arises to be the king, and David is a good king. He does a lot, but you remember that he asked God, God, I want to build, I want to build you a house for you to dwell in. And what did God say? No, no, no you're not going to build it. Why? You're a man of blood. You got blood on your hands, and you're not going to build my kingdom. But I tell you what, this is what God said. You can get everything prepared. You can get everything ready. And when your son Solomon arises as the king in your stead, then everything will be ready and Solomon can then build the temple of God. And Solomon, of course, did exactly that. He built the temple of God and that was the first temple that was built. It was a glorious, magnificent temple uh, It made from marble and brass and gold and silver. And uh, it was on the crest of the hill. When you came to Jerusalem, you could see this temple uh, from miles away as you were coming into the city and it was a glorious structure. But do you remember that God said, now understand that I am not going to personally dwell in that house. I will put my glory in that house. But remember he said, the heavens can't contain me, so how am I going to fit inside this little bitty house that you built for me? And so then Solomon at the end of his life did what? What, what was his, we were, talked about it last week, what did he do at the end of his life? About yeah, vanity of vanities. You remember he married these women, and of course the kings were told in the law of Moses that you were not to marry multiple wives, you were not to raise up great armies, and of course they did exactly what God said not to do. They did marry multiple wives, they did raise 
great armies to fight against their enemies. And all of this is saying, well, I don't trust God and I don't trust His Word. And so they violated God's Word. But our prayer is, at least mine, that Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes at the very end of his life and he recognized the error of his way. Don't know that that's the case. We just can't, we just can't say with any certainty. But you remember now in 1 Kings chapter 12 that Solomon had died and Rehoboam, his son, is going to come to be king. And you remember there had been a man that had worked in Solomon's army. He had been, a, a, in many ways, a great man in Solomon's army. But he saw some of the things that Solomon was doing, and uh, he spoke out against what Solomon was doing. And so Solomon was going to get him, and he flees to Egypt. And this guy's name, of course, is Jeroboam. So Rehoboam is the son of Solomon. Jeroboam had been a general, if you want to use that terminology, in Solomon's army, upset with some of the things Solomon did, and so he flees to Egypt. So Rehoboam is rising to be the next king. Jeroboam, hearing that Solomon died, comes back to Jerusalem, and he tells Jeroboam, or excuse me, Rehoboam, and I get those names mixed up because <laughs> Jeroboam, and we just call them Jerry and Re, I guess. But anyway, so Rehoboam comes back, or Jeroboam comes back to Rehoboam and says, look, the way that your dad treated us was not right. He taxed us. He, makes the, he made us work uh, hard in our fields and labor, and he was getting most of that for himself. And all we ask is that you lighten our burden just a little bit. Just, just give us a little bit of a break. And if you do that, we will follow you to the ends of our day. So Rehoboam consults the older men that had counseled Solomon. And what did they say? Do you remember? That's a great idea, man. That's what you need to do. If you want these people to serve you, lighten up just a little bit. And then Rehoboam consulted the men that he had grown up with. And what did they say? Make it harder. Make it harder. Just, just tell them, you think my dad was tough? You just wait till I'm king. And that attitude is what led to what we're now studying, the divided kingdom. Because Jeroboam takes ten tribes, and you can see it up here on the board, and of course y'all know I'm colorblind. Is that uh, Israel pink? Is that what color that is? Orange. Orange. That's orange? No. It's like peach. Oh, beige. Beige. Yeah. This, beige. this over here is, is uh, not Israel. It's, it's the one right there in the middle. Yeah. Okay. So pink, like I said. <laughs> that beige color is the northern tribes, and there's ten of them, right? And then just below it, and David's got it on the board right there, you've got the tribes of Judah. Uh, which basically they call it Judah. It's Judah and Benjamin together. And so this is called in literature the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. And so the northern kingdom had ten tribes. The southern kingdom had two tribes. And as we pointed out last week in our study, that uh, the kingdom divides, and this divided kingdom is going to last about 250 years. But let's continue. Let's pick up in verse number 16 of 1 Kings chapter 12. 1 Kings chapter 12 and verse 16. When all, so when all Israel saw that the king hearkened or did not listen unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To our tents, O Israel, now see to thine own house, David, so Israel departed under their tent. So what is their response to what Rehoboam said? What are, what are they saying? Forget you. <laughs> Forget you. We're not gonna we're not gonna serve under you. We're not going to do this. We don't have anything to do with you and this son of Jesse by the name of David. We don't have any part with what you're going to do. And so 
They said, see to your house, and we'll take care of our house. You just take care of your own, we'll take care of our own house. But as far, verse 17, at, but as far the children of Israel, which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. And I'm going to go back to that picture in just a moment and, and just remind you that Jerusalem is the capital right there. And you can see how close it is to this boundary with the northern kingdom. Mm -hmm. So Jerusalem is just across the southern boundary of what's going to become the nation of Israel. And so they, they go to their houses, but the ones in the south, and we said this is primarily going to be made up of Judah and Benjamin, they stay with David's uh, descendant, uh, Rehoboam. And so the children of Israel, which dwell in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. So Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. So they, they were in rebellion, and they divided the kingdom in the, and, and I can't say halves in, in one sense, because it was lopsided, but they divided the kingdom. Verse number 20, it came to pass when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, that they sent and called him unto the congregation and made him king over Israel. There was none that followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. And remember, as we said a moment ago, this tribe of Judah, there were some of the Benjamites that were a part of it. But it's basically the tribe of Judah alone. Verse 21, when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah and with the tribe of Benjamin. That's why we said it's Judah and Benjamin. A hundred and fourscore thousand chosen men, which were warriors, to fight against the house of Israel to bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. So what is Rehoboam's answer to this problem? We'll, take them uh, we'll just go back there and we'll whoop those boys and we'll bring, that, we'll bring the kingdom back to me and to me alone. Uh, but the word of God, listen to verse 20. Or excuse me, verse 23. Uh, or verse 22. The word of God came unto Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Ye shall not go up, nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Return every man to his house, for this thing is from me. They hearken therefore to the word of the Lord and return to depart uh, according to the word of the Lord. So they're going to go up and they're going to take that northern tribes, those northern tribes back and make it still one kingdom. But God sends word and says, you better not do it. I'm in control of this. Yes, ma'am. Yes, they, they, they had cities, and I don't know if they're actually on that chart or not, but remember there were the uh, six cities of refuge, mm -hmm. and so part of them were in southern uh, Israel, so so part of the Levites would still be in the well, southern part. They would have to be because that's where the temple was. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. but, but in the northern, they had priests that served in that, with that, with that uh, kingdom also? Yes, and we'll see that uh, it, they become very corrupt in the northern kingdom. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. So yes, there were some uh, of the Levites in the northern kingdom and some of them in the southern kingdom. The majority of them, like you said, are going to be located in Jerusalem, uh, taking care of the activities, but those still six tribes, or excuse me, six cities of refuge were still in operation at that time good question all right so god says don't do it don't do it because this thing is from me so god wanted the kingdom to divide is that what that verse is saying god wanted his people to divide 
He told him it was going to happen. And so uh, God sometimes uses, uh, how can we say this, the rebellion of men to accomplish his will. Keep your, keep your finger over in 1 Kings chapter 12 and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. You know, as we've gone through this study, we have repeatedly said, based on the statement of Paul in Romans chapter 15 and verse number 4, that these things that were written aforetime were written for our learning. So the question we ask, what do we learn from this division that happened what is a takeaway for us as God's people today? Denominationalism. Okay, you see the fruits of denominationalism where, where uh, uh, you know, you can go back to the 1500s when denominationalism really started. And you remember that, uh, and we'll talk some about this uh, in our morning service a little bit, maybe a little bit tonight in our sermon. Uh, but the church was established and we're just going to say 30 AD. I know that some say 33 AD because of a, a mix up in the calendar year. I'm just going to round it to 30 AD and say 30 AD the church is established. You remember that when the church is established God ordained that there were to be elders in every congregation, Acts 14 and verse 23. There's to be elders in every church. And so when you look at the organization of the New Testament church, and boy, I'm getting into my sermon, but that's okay. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Under Jesus Christ, he gave the apostles authority to write the New Testament. And in the writings of the New Testament, we find the authority for elders to exist in every congregation of God's people. But you know that Paul said in Acts chapter 20, talking to those elders from the church of Ephesus, he told them from among your own selves are men going to arise, speaking the first things to draw away disciples after themselves. Acts 20, that's down about uh, 23, 24, right in there. So he said there are going to be men in the eldership who are going to change the organizational structure of the church and they're going to try to get men to follow them. So even in the early years of the church, we see that there were digressions that were already starting to take place. And so what happened, and you can see this, in secular history, it's not recorded in the Bible, but you can see it in secular history. What happened was that after a number of years in the eldership, they decided, you know, we need to have a head elder. We need to have one man that that's kind of the man that's in charge. Now, he, he's not going to have any more authority, they said, than anybody else, but we're going to appoint one man to kind of be uh, a watchman over the eldership and over everybody else. And of course you realize that that was the first step away from what God intended. From that, it started out and they said, well, you know, it would be good if in a congregation, and you, you can imagine, they didn't have transportation like we have transportation today. Imagine a city like Rome. How many congregations of God's people were meeting in Rome? We don't know, but Paul talks about it in Romans 16, 16, the church's Christ salutes you. And if you look at Romans chapter 16, he mentions at least three congregations, if not more, that are, that are in the city of Rome. And so what they did was they said, you know, it would be nice if, all these congregations, even though we have to meet at separate locations for whatever reason, uh, that we would cooperate with each other and we would do things together. And so they said, you know, we need to appoint an elder over the city of Rome. And I'm using that as an example because that's probably where all this really came to blow up. So we're going to appoint one man and he is going to be over the city of Rome. He's going to be the head elder 
over the city of Rome. From that, they said, well, you know, we've got this, this whole nation of Rome, not just the city of Rome, but we've got Italy here, we've got the Roman Empire here, and we need to appoint a man, one man over all the nation. And so now you've got a man that's over all the elders in the cities, and they're over all the elderships that are in the city. You can see the digression that's developing. In 606 AD, a man by the name of Bonaparte III, I believe, Bonaparte, he's either the sixth or the third, I, I think he's the third, I don't remember, declared, I am the universal pope over the entire church. I'm over the entire church. And they referred to him in Latin as El Papa, which is the father, the father. So the Pope is the father, according to them, over all the church. So what, 600 years after the time of Christ and after the establishment of the church, we see this full-blown digression. And so in 606, this man said, I am Pope, I am El Papa, and I'm over every Christian church that exists in the world. Of course, all this time, you've got faithful members of the Lord's church that are fighting against every step of this. No, we're not going to have a head elder. We're not going to appoint one man to be the head elder in the congregation. We're certainly not going to appoint one man to be over the entire city, the nation, or whatever it is. So you've got faithful churches through the years that are always fighting against this. But you've got the digressions, the digressives, if you want to call it that, they digress from the Word of God. And I don't know why they went from being digressive to now to be progressive. <laughs> you think progressive would be better and better, but now they say, oh, we're progressive. What does that mean? We do everything wrong. <laughs> so... <laughs> yeah, so so they're really digressive, whether they call themselves progressive or not, they're digressive. But anyway, from this, that lasted for about 900 years. And the, the Roman Catholic Church became so corrupt, they were selling indulgences. And that what that means is, if I'm mad at Bob and I want to kill him, I would go to the local priest, tell the local priest what I'm going to do, and he would say, well, if you'll donate X amount of money to the church, I give you permission to kill Bob, and it won't be held against you. That was the sale of indulgence. Mm -hmm. And so then I go kill Bob, and according to the Roman Catholic priest, I'm still heading straight to heaven because that so upset men like Martin Luther and others that they said, this is not what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. And so in 1500, Martin Luther nailed his, was it 97 thesis that he nailed on the church door? And every one of them, 97, we could call it accusations against what the Roman Catholic Church was doing. Here's where you're wrong. Here's where you're wrong. He listed 97 of them put him on the church door where he had served as one of the priests, nailed it on the church door, and said, this is what the Catholic Church is doing wrong. And then, of course, he began to challenge to debate Roman Catholic priests and whoever cardinals, whoever would debate him. Here's where you're wrong, and I'm showing you from the Bible where you're wrong. And so he had, in one sense, a good idea. The Roman Catholic Church is wrong. But here's what Martin Luther did. He said, we need to reform the Roman Catholic Church. Because there were some things in the Bible that Martin Luther didn't really care for. Mm -hmm. So he said, we're going to reform the Roman Catholic Church. That's why that movement is called the Reformation Movement. We're going to reform Catholicism. That is not restoration. That is reformation. Restoration is where you take it back to its original state. Mm -hmm. 
and you say this is what it was originally and that's what we want to be. So that's the great difference between what's been called the Reformation Movement and the Restoration Movement. But anyway, starting with Martin Luther, other men picked up on this. Uh, John Calvin, uh, who was Zwingli, I can't remember Zwingli's first name. These guys started saying, look, these things are wrong. And instead of saying, let's go back to the original, Martin Luther said, let's reform the Roman Catholic Church. And of course, even though he said, please don't do it, they still called themselves Lutherans. And that church still exists today. So 1,500 years after the establishment of the Lord's Church, we have denominationalism fully exploding on the scene of the world. And so remember, don't forget where I was because I haven't. Y'all thought I had, but I hadn't. Uh, we're talking about this division between the northern tribe and the southern tribe, and God saying, you don't go up there and force them to serve me. This is from me. And we ask the question, why? Well, look at 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 19. For there must be heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. <laughs> what does 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 19 teach us? There's always going to be division. There's always going to be error that is going to be taught. And, you know, some say, well, why didn't God just strike Boniface the third dead? <laughs> And that would have put an end to the Roman Catholic Church, or at least uh, temporarily it would have been. And any man that raised up and said, I'm going to be El Papa, if God had just killed him, we wouldn't see the Roman Catholic Church today. Why didn't God do that? Well, I think we have a key right here. Yes, ma'am. You have to choose to follow God or not. I mean, if you're going to follow God, you have to do it this way. That's exactly right. And for us to choose, there has to be a choice. There has to be a choice. Mm -hmm. Here's what's right. Here's what's mm -hmm. wrong. Am I going to do what's right? Am I going to do what's wrong? And so Paul said, even in the Lord's church, there's going to be error. There are going to be men that are going to be divisive. But the reason God tolerates that is so that he can see who's going to make the choice to be right and who's going to make the choice to be wrong. Paul, we need to... Uh prophesied that there has to be a great falling away. That's exactly right. First and Second Thessalonians both. He talks about a great falling away that's going to take place. I think uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, that man of sin is most likely talking about the ascension of the, the, the ultimately the Pope, that he's going to arise to the throne. Uh, the Pope is going to arise. So he's called the man of sin, the man of perdition in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So this was, this was we were told it was going to happen, and yet you've got people still saying, I want to be a part of it. <laughs> and Paul's saying, that's the son of perdition you're following. That's the, the man of sin that you're following. You're going to do that? So I would say, going back to 1 Kings chapter 12, that we have a same type scenario. Are you going to follow me? Are you going to follow some man? And the ten tribes went with Jeroboam. And that tells you the majority of people is going to go that way. And, and that's one of the lessons we learn. Most folks are going to go the way of error. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, there's a straight and narrow way and there's a broad way. The broad way, there are going to be how many that go in? Many therein, or that go therein. So there are going to be a lot of people that follow the broad way, but there's a straight and narrow way. How many people are going to find it? Yeah. Few, just a few. And I don't know if we can uh, extrapolate some, any numbers, uh, but in the days of Noah, there were eight. There were eight people that followed after God. In the days of Elijah, there were 7,000 people that had still not bowed their knee unto Baal. Among the millions of Israelites, 7,000 
Elijah, quit whining like a little baby and get out of that cave because you're not alone. There's still 7,000 people that are doing the exact same thing that you're doing. And by the way, we learned from that that small, what is the song uh, that uh, I'm trying to think, when God is in it, it, something little when God is in it, do y'all remember that song? Uh, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to look it up. I don't know if it's in our song book, but there's a song that talks about even if it's little with God in it, it's, it's going to be good. Uh, so anyway, God says, going back to 1 Kings chapter 12, you don't fight against your brethren. You don't, you don't kill your brothers and sisters. So verse 25, Jeroboam built Shechem in Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein and went out thence and built, Pen and built Penuel. And Jeroboam <clears throat> said in his heart, now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. So what is he thinking? What is, what is old Jeroboam thinking right now? Yeah, they're, they're going to eventually get tired of me. And he's thinking, and I brought this up, uh, he built Shechem, see, which is right up here, Shechem, and he built Penuel, he built these two cities. And, and I would, this is my think so, so don't, don't take it anymore than my think so. I think he's building off of these city of refuge. I'm going to build me a couple of cities that are going to be predominant cities and now notice what happens. He says in verse 26, now the kingdom's going to return to the house of David. Why? Why is he thinking that? What are the Israelites supposed to do three times a year, at least the men? They got to come back to Jerusalem to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So it's not very far for them. They've been doing this for hundreds of years, it's not very far for them, even if you live way up there in the north in Dan. Uh, what is the nation of Israel uh, right now? It's about 135 miles long. Am I thinking correctly? It's not, it's not a huge, it's not talking about a lot of geography. I mean, so they're going to come down to Jerusalem three times a year to worship God, and, and they're going to come back, and they're going to start worshiping God, and they're going to think, well, why did we leave why did we divide to begin with? Yeah. So Jeroboam decides he's going to come up with an alternative worship. Mm -hmm. Well, I know they're going to go back to Jerusalem to worship, but if I give them another opportunity and another temple and another place to worship, well, they're not going to go back to Jerusalem. Verse 27. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, by the way, I just just chase a rabbit about that far when he says go up. If you're in Dan, would you be going up to Jerusalem? <laughs> You'd be going down because it's north, but you can't get to Jerusalem without going up because it's built on the mountain. <laughs> so even geographically, Little statements that we think, well, it doesn't make any difference. Maybe they just said that, you know. We're gonna we're gonna go down to Mama's house, and Mama may live somewhere up north of us, but we're going down to Mama. We we do use phrases like that, and it may well be that that's what the writer is doing. But I suggest to you that geographically, even if you leave down, you got to go up to Jerusalem because it's on top of a mountain. Mount Zion. Mount Zion. That's exactly right. So if the people go up to sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, <coughs> king of Judah. So in his mind, he's like, well, they're eventually going to get tired of this. They're going to kill me, and they're just going to reunite the kingdom. So I've got to come up with a scheme to stop that. So verse 28. Whereupon the king took counsel, and his counsel came from whom? <laughs> well, from men. 
He got his counsel from men, not from God. He didn't ask God, God, what do I need to do? He took counsel and he made two calves of gold and said unto them, now, this is, this is a great sermon <laughs> right here. He said, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set one in Bethel, and he put one in Dan. So he builds two temples with idols. One in Bethel, which is just maybe 30 miles north of Jerusalem, so they don't have to cross that border to go to Bethel to worship. And those folks that live up here up in Megiddo and Hamath and up in that, they don't even have to drive down to Bethel. They can just run up to Dan. It's going to be so much nicer and handier and convenient. You don't have to go all the way down to Jerusalem. That's just too far for you to go. It's too much for you to, to go down to Jerusalem as you were commanded. So I'm going to build two calves. I'm going to put one in Dan, I'm going to put one in Bethel, and you don't have to go to Jerusalem anymore. He lied to them too. The calves didn't bring them out of Egypt. That's exactly right. He, he, he and, and uh, I don't know if he's going back to what uh, Moses did, <laughs> you know, when they, they're waiting for Moses, or not Moses, but, uh, Moses, Aaron. Uh, Aaron. Uh, what Aaron did when Moses is up on the mountain and make the two calves, I don't know if that's what he, I don't know where he's, but he took counsel from somewhere and he came up with this great scheme. Well, that's too hard. You don't want to drive that far. So just come on down here. So this thing, verse 30, became a sin. Really? <laughs> yeah. For the people went to worship before the one even unto Dan. And he made a house of high places. A house of high places. What is, why, why high places? We've talked about this in other studies. Why high places? Well, the temple was on Mount Zion. It's kind of, well. Mimicking. Yeah, make it look like. Yeah, yeah. We're going we're gonna to build our temple up on the high places. By the way, these these began to flourish, and they didn't have just temples in Dan and Bethel anymore. They, they were scattered throughout that northern kingdom, but they would build these mounds or take a hill that was already there, and they would build a place of worship on those. That's why it's called going to the high places when they would go to worship God. And he made a house of high places, verse 31. Now watch this. And made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. That's what Mary was asking a moment ago. He's not even going to bother with making them from the Levites. He gets the lowest scoundrel that'll do it, that'll take enough money, and he becomes a priest. <laughs> Boy, you, you, uh, if, if we cannot see the division that exists in religion today. Same thing. Yep. And you can get some old guy that's the lowest scoundrel, but if you pay him enough money, he'll stand in that pulpit and he'll make you feel good. Mm -hmm. So, we're going to pause here because verse 32 and 33 uh, have some, some uh, very important things to say. Now, I'm going to say this again. I haven't forgot we're doing the survey, but we're, we're laying these points that need to be uh, emphasized. And so what we're going to see in 32 and 33, well, y'all read it this week. Be ready to come back and talk about why did he choose that date? Why did he choose the date that he did? That'll be your homework assignment. Anybody, any questions, thoughts, comments? Little as much as God is in it. That's it. I knew it had little and God and much and all that in it. I just couldn't get it together. Little as much if God is in it. It's a great, great song, by the way. Anybody else? All right. Thank y'all.
God is not the author of confusion. The devil is. The devil is. God, he has provided in his Bible. The truth is his. The truth is his. Satan does not want us to know. Seeds full of doubt is what he sows. He is the adversary. Call on the name of Jesus. Follow the way that Jesus shows. God is not the author of confusion. The devil is. The devil is. God, he has provided in his Bible. The truth is his. The truth is his. People will say you cannot know. That is just disbelief they show. I believe Jesus when he tells us that we can know the truth and the truth will set us free. God is not the author of confusion. The devil is. The devil is. God, he has provided in his Bible. The truth is his. The truth is his. God, he has told us in his word that he has given us a sword. With it expose the errors, cut fables with a fervor, point to his unity, the Lord. God is not the author of confusion. The devil is, the devil is. God, he has provided in his Bible. The truth is his, the truth is his.